If you have your Bible, uh, would you open to 1 Corinthians 15? If you don't have your Bible and you have a mobile device, would you uh, open your Bible app? If you don't have a Bible app, would you open your app store and download a Bible app and uh, navigate to 1 Corinthians chapter 15? We're starting a new series this morning entitled Unshakable. Can somebody say unshakable? I don't know if you're paying attention or not, but things are shaking up out there. Anybody feeling it? It is shaking. And if we're not properly equipped, properly strengthened, if we are not centered in the truth of what we hold on to, what we hope in, what is the substance of our faith, the course of our life, what is our inner strength and power, our eternal hope, if we're not, if we're not set, dead set in that hope, then we have the capacity to be shaken as well. In my pastor's heart for my Christchurch family and for all of you following online at home and across the country and who knows where else, is that you would find the strength that God provides to be unshaken, to be unshaken. Because the world's not gonna get any less scary, any less shaky, any less unstable. Uh, We're all waiting for that, it's not gonna happen. The question is, will you be unshakable? Will you be immovable? Will you be steadfast? We're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 50 to 58. So those nine short verses. And we're going to contain ourselves there. I have no slides. I have no points. We're just going to saturate in this verse. And I want us to really understand the heart of God. Because we are at a unique place, susceptible as 21st century, somewhat wealthy Americans who've enjoyed the stability of our economy and the stability of our healthcare system and the stability of our country and our, our relative safety. We are in really danger of moving our hope from where it ought to lie to where it's felt safe and secure for a long time. And that means that we are susceptible to being shaken. I teach a lot of kids to surf. Uh, Any surfers in the room? All right, so both of you will love my illustrations. Great, excellent. (laughs) So um, we had our beach baptisms at the beach two weeks ago, and uh, it was the waves were big and rough. And um, the waves were kind of belching up onto the sandbar. And so it went from being this deep to being like this deep. And there was a big smackdown. And so we were trying very hard to keep everybody stable. And uh, when, you, when you're in the ocean, you know that you can get easily shaken. Anybody have been unexpectedly knocked down by a wave at the beach? Yeah, all right, broaden the audience. So one of the things I like to teach kids when they're surfing is like you can't fight those waves. They're stronger than you, bigger than you. They'll knock you down every single time. But you can learn to navigate them. And so in the, in the intermediate surfing lessons, I teach kids how to duck dive, how to get their board under the wave, how to miss where all that energy is to just sneak right out. And I can just paddle right out and monster surf and just make it right out, as long as you know how to avoid that shaking. And when I teach kids how to fall, that's lesson three. That's a really important one. You ever start surfing, you get tangled up with your board and dinged up and cut up and banged up. And part of it is you don't know how to get out of the way. But when you learn how to get out of the way, you can avoid the shaking. Right now, our whole world is going through a shaking that we're all experiencing together. And on individual levels, many people are going through their own personal shaking. One of the benefits that's coming out of this is it's reminding all of us that everyone you encounter is experiencing some kind of hurt, some kind of disappointment, some kind of trauma, some kind of shaking whether you know about it or not. This is why it's so important for us as the church of Jesus to be kind, to be patient, to be gentle, to be forgiving. We don't know what everyone's going through, but right now we're all going through this together. And for the next four weeks, I want us to talk about that which is unshakable, namely the kingdom of God, which is what you happen to be a part of if your faith is in Jesus and which is the true stability that allows you to make it through this world without being shaken, tossed, turned, or even shipwrecked. And so I want to read 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. Follow along in your Bible or on your mobile device. I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, speaking of death, But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body 
must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. God, we thank you for this passage from the scriptures that's been read in our hearing. God, I pray your spirit's blessing would dwell upon it, that its purpose would be achieved by your power in our hearts and minds. God, I pray that lost and dead souls would be found and come to life. God, I pray that the weak and weary would find strength. God, I pray that those shaken would find stability. Lord, in this season that we are walking through together, I pray, God, that you would allow this passage and ones like it to set our feet upon the rock, that we would experience the unshakable kingdom of God and find hope and strength and power and resources from you to be everything that you have called us to be, to be saturated in your unconditional love, to be filled with your spirit, to be bold for witness, God, to be overflowing, to be forgiving and kind and patient and gentle and generous, to have our eyes set on a certain and future hope. Lord, write this truth upon our heart. We ask you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Part of the reason I want to start here in 1 Corinthians 15 is that as 21st century Americans, we have been enjoying something of some stability. Now, obviously, it's not been certainly stable. Uh, if you've been around for any length of time, you know the economy has peaks and valleys. Can I get an amen? Some of us are still talking about what we lost in 08 or the house we shouldn't have bought in 05. We're all riding the wave of the instability. And yet, on the big scheme of things, our world has been relatively stable. We've had no wars at home or been engaged in any global conflicts since World War II ended in the 40s, most of our lifetimes. We have experienced the prosperity of the, a blooming economy, and obviously it's had its ups and downs as well, but for the most part, uh, all of us are experiencing the benefit of a somewhat stable economy, the U.S. dollar is valuable in the world, and we've been experiencing the blessing of the technological age when everything's begun to get easier and easier and information's closer and closer at hand and opportunity is, is there to be had where we're more connected than ever. We've been experiencing the blessing of a uh, changed healthcare system and have, a, have access to prescription drugs and treatment and things to improve your quality of life and even save lives. Mortality rates have come down. All sorts of good things have happened in our lifetime. And that's a good thing to celebrate, isn't it? It's not a bad thing. I'm not speaking evil of any of those things. And yet, because that's been our experience, a subtle shift can take place where we, unlike our counterparts in the near history, shift our hope from the kingdom of God, which is unshakable, into the kingdom of this world, which has given us some safety, some provision, some hope, some stability for some period of time. And yet, right now, in this moment, with this pandemic, and unfortunately, more drastically, the, our response to this pandemic, has begun to shake things that we held as an unspoken expectation for years. And it's all around you. Maybe, maybe all of us are experiencing this a little differently, but it's all around us. Everything has changed. We went to Chick-fil-A yesterday. It's a little different in Port Orange. You guys been to the Port Orange Chick-fil-A? It's fully adapted to the pandemic. Fully double lane, takeout only, giant roof, pay stations, People taking orders. The drive through window is a drive through door for ease of access. Chick-fil-A has adapted to the world as we now know it. It's actually pretty sweet. We got dinner for seven in like 15 minutes. Couldn't find a place to eat it, but. 
We're getting used to identifying if someone's smiling at us or not with their eyes. Right? Our world got weird. And for many people, your business exploded. Your world got easier. You got to go home and work from home in your jammies. You got to be around your kids who you loved. Now you're wishing you'd go back to school, but our world got unstable. Part of the instability that I want us to be provoked to think about this morning is how much our life in this present age has given us the expectation of both health and a quality of life and an extended and long life as the norm. This is something all of us expect and don't even think about. And yet this has not been the case for human history up until this very recent past. For example, my grandmother had five siblings who lived. There were 13 of them born to her parents. The others did not make it. Most of them passed their first year, which is terrible and sad and yet was commonplace during that period of time. Historically, childbirth has been one of the most life-threatening things a woman will go through in history. And yet we exist in a world where through technology and medical treatments and vaccinations and, and chemotherapy and surgeries, we are able to prolong life and to increase the quality of life for many. And isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? I wanna be like the first one to say, use your God-given gifts smart people and make our world a better place to live. And not just, not just doctors and those working in the medical field. I want bankers to do the same thing. I want, I want people, an infrastructure and solar energy and anything we can do to make our world better. Shouldn't we do it? The problem is when we subtly expect it and then we begin to kind of demand it and then we don't realize that we've actually set our hope upon it. And the problem is when we do that and it gets a little shaky, we respond not the way that God intends for us to respond. We, we respond like those who are in the kingdom of this world. We respond with fear. We, res we respond with animosity towards people who are different than us and disagree with us. We freak out. We do crazy things. We make drastic changes. We give up on things that are important. We lose sight of what's true. And this passage does for us something of a resetting. It grounds us in that which is truly unshakable. This section comes at the end of a chapter devoted to the topic of the resurrection of the dead. The church here in Corinth, some people were starting to say that there is no resurrection of the dead. That never was a thing. It's not going to be a thing. And the Apostle Paul is saying, absolutely not. It's a part of the message we preach to you. That Jesus Christ died that he was buried on the third day. He rose from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. It's the long story. It's what God was doing. It's part and parcel. He goes on to say, if, if you are hoping in Christ for this life only and you have no hope for life after death, he says, I pity the fool that lives life like that. You're just having a sad little pathetic existence and then you're dead and gone forever. Absolutely, there is a resurrection. And then he encounters the questions, the dilemmas, the, oh yeah, well then what about this? And well, what about this? And he answers all of them. It's a beautiful chapter. You should read the whole thing. But we get to the end and the apostle Paul's reminding us that the kingdom of God, which is in us who believe and all around us in the church and expanding across the globe right now, is the only stable thing you can put your hope in, and it beats sickness and death in the end, transcends sickness and death, delivers from sickness and death. And in fact, when God calls it, and when the jig is up, and the trumpet sounds, every human being alive will not die, but will be instantly changed into a sick-free, sin-free body that God has intended for you if your faith is in Jesus. And every person who's died in faith gets put back together again, and this is where we encounter God in the kingdom as it will stand on earth forever. It's called the kingdom of God. The people of God have hoped in this kingdom all throughout the history of humanity and the church, and this has got to be the unshakable foundation of our hope, or we are bound to overreact like everybody else to get caught up not just in the pandemic but the pandemonium 
ultimately to find ourselves shaking. And this is not the will of God for you, nor is it the position from which you will be able to share the life-altering hope that we have in Jesus. Do you know that? And so what does the apostle say? He says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood, this physical stuff we're in now cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We need a renovation, generation renovation. We need a renewal. We need to be changed into something we are not. He says, nor does the perishable put on the imperishable. Uh, we talk about this sometimes when we talk about canned goods. Anybody ever participate in a food drive? What do they want? Non-perishable. So you go to your cabinet and you bring those poor people all the things you wish you hadn't bought. Yeah, food drive, that means kidney beans, old peaches, fruit cocktail, corned beef hash. Had that case of a power outage, right? And you deliver those things, why? Because they last a long time. Conversely, perishable items, let's say fruit. We have this fruit bowl in our kitchen. Kids can have fruit. There's fruit available. They just munch on the fruit. But every once in a while, something will decompose in the fruit bowl, right? Flies start to buzz. The other day, I was, it was Taco Tuesday. We were making tacos. It's been like nine weeks in a row of Taco Tuesday. I'm getting tired of tacos on Tuesday. But I had these beautiful tomatoes because I don't put my tomatoes in the refrigerator. I like to have them out. And they were in the fruit bowl. And so I was ready to cut up these tomatoes and I grabbed one of them and its skin just slid off in my hand. Oh! <laughs> Perishable was happening in there. Using these categories... The Apostle Paul is writing to compare and contrast our experience here on this earth physically and what is to come when we inherit, when we are gifted the kingdom that Jesus died to provide and welcome us into. He says, you can't, the kingdom that's coming isn't made for this perishable body. It's made for an imperishable, not a mortal experience, but an immortal. And so there will be a change and that change happens in the resurrection. And we are people of resurrection hope. Do you know it? So think about this for a second. You are perishable. Some of us are perishing faster than others, aren't we? I've always been blessed with a big forehead, but man, it's getting bigger every year. Every single year, I'm like, more of it, there's some more of it. We start to experience, you know, you see, I'm, I'm approaching 40, I'm gonna turn 39 this year, and then every year after that. And, um, <laughs> And so I'm like, I'm already recognizing that I make decisions, I calculate decisions based on how it's going to make me feel tomorrow, which is not something I used to do when I was uh, teens and 20s and even 30s. I did not think about it. So last night, uh, Saturday was family day. We had a really nice family day. And we even planned yesterday in a way to have a good time with the family, but to get to bed at a decent hour because I get up early, get up really early on Sunday morning. So we were going to go to bed early last night to get a good night's sleep, feel good and rested for church. And so we made decisions like instead of taking the kids to the beach and the park, we just hung out and then went to the park. We were, we were winning at parenting yesterday. So traffic was crazy because this little event in town. And so we get to dinner a little late, we took the kids for ice cream. The park was open. Remember the park? Yeah, so we took the kids across the street. They played in the park. We stayed a little later than we were planning to. We roll home. It's 8.30. We're ready to get the kids in bed. It's a little later, but we're ready. And so we have this routine. Our bedtime routine takes like two hours when you have four kids and they're little. I mean, it's a whole negotiation. I heard one comedian say, it's like a hostage negotiation in reverse. What do you want to just stay in there? Just stay in that room. I'll give you anything you want. What do you want, a helicopter to Cuba? Done, right? So here... here here we are, and we're used to this routine. Now, Julian didn't get a nap, so I'm like banking on the fact that he's going to go out quick. Usually it's this like, I want, you, I want juice, and I want you to read me a book, and I want you to rock me, and I want you to tug me in, and I want you to snuggle me in. And then he gets to like, I'm leaving. It's been an hour trying to get him to go down, and I'm leaving him in his room, and he's like, I want you to sit on the stairs. Like me being on the stairs makes him feel better to fall asleep. So I'm like, okay, buddy, I'll sit on the stairs. And then I sit there, and I'm like, <laughs> pretty much every night that's what happens. So last night we get home. And remarkably, even after our little decisions that delayed bedtime, everybody went to bed, even Julian, just like that. And so at nine o'clock, Tiffany and I were sitting on our front porch, looking down at International Speedway Boulevard and the mayhem that was ensuing in traffic, enjoying time together, ready to go to bed early. And just about the time we were about to go to bed, we looked at the moon starts to rise. Did you guys see the moon last night? Beautiful, dark orange moon coming through these clouds. And so we're just admiring the moon. And then I noticed to the left of the moon, there is a star that I have never seen. And it's moving with the moon. So I get on my phone, 
we find out we were looking at Mars with the naked eye. And so I went inside, got my telescope, set up my telescope in the road. I'm geeking out in the road with my telescope. All my neighbors are coming home from partying. Some of them in various stages of inebriation. All, everybody walking by. And so we have this little cluster around the telescope and we're staring at the craters and the moon and Mars and we're talking about the distance of Mars and the moon and the size. And then I look down and it's 1140. What happened? And I instantly started to feel that regret, like, I'm going to feel this, you know? <laughs> like, what is that? Perishable. <laughs> I went, we finally went to bed at like 1230. I'm like, this is a mistake. My alarm is set for 530 just in case. I know that's not going to happen. So I'm running on nap energy right now, not sleep energy as it is. But at 3 a.m., I open my eyes and here's Julian standing by my bed. He goes, how much you to sit on the stairs? I'm like, oh my gosh. Come on. Come on. So, so I wake up this morning and I'm going, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And I'm just thinking, coffee, coffee is my friend. And then a nap later. Oh, I'm going to sleep later. Yeah. Listen, when I, was a, I used, when I was in my 20s, are you kidding me? Sleep was like giving up. You remember that? You're like, I worked all day and I got my paper done and I went to school, went to class. You're like, it's nine o'clock. You're like, let's go do something. And then at 11, you're like, let's go see a movie. And then at like 2.30, you're like, oh, I got to cram for that one thing in the morning. I would get like three hours of sleep. It was a good night for me. All through my 20s, I was like that. I mean, I would fall asleep driving and stuff, which was dangerous. But, <laughs> but I was like, the idea of a nap as a 23-year-old, I was like, who would want to waste their life with a nap? And now I'm like, I will nap any chance I get. Why? Perishing. <laughs> We're all feeling it. I got out of bed. I started making those noises. You, ever, you make those? I didn't used to make noises when I got to bed. Ugh. Like, was my dad here? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> See, we're all on the decline, aren't we? And the world's selling us a bill of goods that's telling us all the ways that we can prolong this and that we can counteract this and we can inject this and we can suck this and we can work this and we can make it through. And we start to believe that real life is to be lived right now. But then what happens? Well, they tell us there's a killer bug that's going to wipe out the planet. But if you just do what we say, everyone's going to be fine. And everyone's freaking out. Why? Why are we freaking out? Because we're shaken. Why are we shaken? Because we demanded safety, security, health, quality of life. And we actually, even subtly without even noticing it, maybe, put our hope in it. Certainly there's people out there, outside those walls, who their hope is shaken to the core. They don't want to see you. They don't want to get within six feet of you. They don't want to see your mouth because they're afraid because you bring with you the propensity for their demise because of where their hope is built. This is not the ground of the Christian hope. All of us are going to die. This is a very uplifting sermon, isn't it? <laughs> it's just part of life. The question is, will any of us truly live? And the Apostle Paul points to a moment in time that we are not privy to in which Jesus sounds the trumpet and life as we have known it in this age comes to an end and gives way to the next age. And in the next age, those who have been found faithful, who are putting their trust in Christ, who are walking with God, who are the recipients of his grace, who have believed in him, who have experienced the miraculous regeneration of inward transformation, that transformation will be visible on the outside, praise Jesus. I don't know exactly what it'll look like, but it will have a glory beyond that which we've ever experienced. I was listening to some old pastors talk about this about five years ago. One of them was like 88 years old at the time. And he said, I think when Jesus comes back, all of us are going to get our body at 33 because that's how old Jesus was when he died. And I remember thinking to myself, I was better at 27. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be 33. In fact, I don't think it's going to be a lot like we might expect, but here's what it is going to be. The perishable must become the imperishable. The mortal must become the immortal. And this is the gift of God to every person who trusts in him. And this is the hope and security of the foundation with which we live in every single day. I love Psalm 33 that Bill read during worship. We don't fear our death and demise from a foreign attack. And we don't fear the, the provision of famine because God's got us. We rest in him. We belong to him. We trust in him. And he is the one who has founded us in his kingdom. And he's the one who will bring us through. Isn't it amazing, brothers and sisters? We are not free of sickness, sin, and death. None of us are. You can't become free of sin, sickness, and death in the kingdoms of this world. 
But in Christ, we will transcend this world and we will become sin and sick and death proof and that forevermore. And that is the Christian hope. So he points us to the time when this will happen, when the dead will be raised imperishable, we shall be changed. And he says, when, not if, 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and when the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Victory, victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's amazing though, he answers this question. I always read that like rhetorical. This kind of hit me as like spiritual smack. You know? Where's your, where, where's your victory now, death? Booyah! Like I'm in Christ, I'm like, what, what you got on me now? Hmm? You got nothing on me, child of the king. <laughs> Seriously, it sounds like smack talk. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And yet then the next verse, he answers the question right where it is. Here's where it is. Look, the sting of death, sin, and the power of sin is the law. What in the world does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. The sting of death is all around us. We're all, we're all experiencing the sting of death, like being surrounded by a thousand bumblebees. The sting of death is all around us. It's the sin that inverts the image of God and the glory of God and the calling of humanity. It's, it's that part of humanity that craves to have stability and is driven by either fear or greed. It's what runs our capitalist economy. It's, it's everything. It's all around us and it's me, 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 me. It's why we ran out of toilet paper. That's the sting of sin right there, right? Why didn't everybody just buy one? People are like, I'm buying all of them. I don't care about your butt. What was that? Sting of, sting of sin. That's it. It's right there. That's the sting of death. It's, it's sin. It's the me, 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 me. It's, what, it's why some people in this pandemic are becoming exceedingly wealthy. And others are losing everything. And people are fine with that. It's the reason why this bug, that there have been lots like it, H1N1, swine flu, bird flu, SARS. You can go back all the way to when they didn't have names for things and didn't know what it was. And they just called it the flu or tuberculosis. We just know what stuff is. It's not gonna change everybody. They're gonna keep coming. Some new critter is gonna give us some new bug. People are gonna get sick. People are gonna die. Question is, are we gonna be so terrified of it that we don't actually live? Think about it. Here's the thing, you weren't made for this life only. Your body isn't gonna make it to the next one. You gotta, you gotta get a new one to get into the next one. And this is what happens when death gets swallowed up in, in victory. Now listen, the sting of death is sin. It's that impulse and it's in every one of us. I wish there was the good people and the bad people and I could tell you how to get on the good side. There's not. The, the line of good and evil runs through every human heart. The question is, will you allow God to give you a new heart now and a new body later? Or are we gonna be under that power of death and grabbing to get ours and to be safe and to find security and to do whatever we have to do to feel good about us and to feel safe? We're in a shaky ground. That's what sin will take you to. And the power of sin is the law. And this is a little hard because it requires trust. God gives us laws and they feel confining. Any teenagers in the room? Are you here because you want to be? <laughs> Didn't think so. Your parents have rules. And if you live in my house, you obey my rules, right? Here's the deal. That's, that's the constraint of law. When our heart is against or doubts the motive behind the rule and the person behind the rule, those laws feel constraining and they feel like death and restriction. I'll never forget how free I felt when I got my license and my first car. I was like, I'll never see you guys ever again. <laughs> I mean, I came back because I was hungry for dinner, but I was like free as a bird, never felt happier, right? And here, here's the thing, laws, the laws were never given to constrain us. God was always trying to set us free. Did you know that? Read the 10 commandments. Go to Exodus chapter 20, read the 10 commandments. You can't do this, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. You're like, well, this seems kind of oppressive, doesn't it? No, he says, I was the God that brought you out of what? Slavery in Egypt. And he gives us a law that's good for us, that requires us to depend on him, that puts us in connection with him, that's life-giving for us, and there's something in us that goes, but I don't wanna do that. Let's talk about Sabbath, fourth command, fourth commandment. Think about it for a second. He says, observe the Sabbath and keep that day holy. Americans are not good at that, are we? 
Nope. We're like, when are you going to take a day off? When I hit the bottom line, when I get my project done, when this is finished and that is finished, then I'm going to rest. We're like busy, 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 fall over, rest. That's how we do it. Sometimes we do that all the way until we retire. We're like work, 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 65. Ha ha, I made it. You're like, what is this? Not what I was expecting. And who am I? Oh my gosh. See, but we were made for rhythm. We were made for rest. You know, you were made by God for God, to work with God. And he said, here's what's good for you. Here's what's good for you, ready? Work, 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 rest. Can we do that? And he's like, actually, you know what? I'm gonna make the whole earth in such a way that I illustrate that for you. Work, 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 rest. And you read the, the creation account, and we're going through this with our girls. I'm ho- helping to homeschool, so you, I'll be graded too. And uh, we're talking about science and history and the curriculum they're in has them learning the creation account. And I was teaching the girls, this creation account isn't necessarily about the how God made material stuff. They'll ask you the questions. How is it on day one we have night and day and then the morning and evening and all these days, then you get to day four before we have a sun and moon and stars. How does that work? You're like, well, you're our little scientist there, aren't you? (laughs) Right? Because it's not telling us how everything came into being physically. He's, this is God saying, I made everything. Yes, absolutely. I, f- I formed it, form, 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 and then I filled it, fill, fill, fill. And so he formed on day one, light and dark. And he formed on day two, the sky and the sea. And then he formed on day three, the ground and the dry land. And then on day four, corresponding back to day one, he filled the day and night with the heavenly bodies. And on day two, day five, he filled the sky and the, and, the, and the seas with the fish and the birds. And then day six, he filled the dry land with the beasts and everything that creeps along the earth and then mankind. You see that? It's not supposed to be a linear way God made everything. It's not evolutionary biology. He's forming and filling. And it's important because when you get to the story about the temple and the temple is made, that's the language that's used. He forms the temple, he forms the rooms, he forms the altars, and then they fill the temple with all the different elements. And then what happens on the seventh day? The spirit of God descends and the glory of God falls in that place. See, God's not just trying to give you a day off. He's trying to give you a chance to connect with the life-giving spirit of God himself. God didn't need a day off. God wasn't like, I'm gonna make the whole world and then I'm gonna need a break. I'm gonna need some me time. (sighs) It's not about recreation. Do you understand? This is about relationship. And so why do we have Sabbath? Why? Because we need to not work every day because we need to go, actually, it's not me and my hard work that's made me as successful as I am. It's the God who has his hand on me and gives me everything that I need. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop working today. I'm gonna let God provide. Think about it for a second. And I'm only just not gonna just stop working, but I'm actually gonna utilize this rhythm and rest that God created me for and placed me in. I'm gonna receive it as a gift and I'm gonna use it to connect with people and to connect with God and to be rejuvenated in, in my spirit. And so God wants to give you just rhythm and rest. And yet there's something in us that goes, I don't like being told what to do. I don't wanna take today off. Don't you, t- don't you put that law on me. I'm, I'm gonna do, and we push against it. And sometimes we end up living our life like, the do- like a dog at the end of a short leash. I don't have dogs, I'm not a dog person, but lots of people walk their dogs in my, in my neighborhood. And you see the nice little dogs? They're just on the leash, lots of slack. Hey, this is fun, you and me, we're hanging out. And then there's the dogs that are like, like and you, the faster they go with the dog, the dog does not adjust at any point, you know? Like, what is that? And yet, that's how we live our lives sometimes. What is that? That, brothers and sisters, is the sting of death all around us. It's an unwillingness to just trust in God and walk with him and rest in him. And, we, and it makes you perceive every command God gives you is some constraining thing that you have to do in order to please him or to, or, or, or to be accepted. And it's not like that at all. God's literally gifted us his commands. But the good news is that in Jesus... We don't have a law written on tablets of stone or on pages of paper. We have a law that's put into our hearts. The presence of God speaks life and says, no, no, take a break. Come connect with me and let me provide for you. And let let me take the credit for giving you everything that you need. And yes, be my person and live this way and do these things, but do it with me. And this is the kind of kingdom mentality that the church of Jesus needs right now. Right now, we need to be the people who expect for the perishable to put on the imperishable. 
The people who expect the mortal to put on the immortal, the people who go, yes, sickness and death are part of this world. Any way we can stop that from affecting us, good. Should we hope in that and demand it? Absolutely not. And so we, won't, we don't want to let a overreaction to a pandemic stop us from fulfilling the calling God has for every single one of us. Do you know that? We are people of presence. We are people of purpose. We are people of good news. And so I'm so glad people at home can connect through our, through our video cameras in this room and connect with us and stay a part of the sermons. But you aren't made to be locked up. And if you're believing one way that's got you sacrificing everything just to stay alive, have you truly received the kingdom of life? Some of you are going to be ticked at me for saying this. I already get people criticizing us for even having our church doors open. It's irresponsible. It's unloving. Putting lives at risk. I tell people, like, they don't have to come. I don't make them. I don't even call them. <laughs> you don't have to come. I don't really even kind of want you to. But look, I'm here to tell you, you have, you have been gifted an eternal kingdom that was blood bought and the most sure thing you can put your hope in. It's the only thing you can count on in this life. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Has, has a shift happened in your heart and mind? Have you bought into the world system to go, this is living, and therefore I must react with everyone else the same way. Now listen, if your life is at risk, don't go out. If you're sick, don't cough on me, okay? If, if you're a human, wash your hands. This is the one thing, Tiffany and I talk about this all the time. We're like, I can't believe they're making us do this. I can't believe we have these restrictions. And then she's like, but I'm glad people are washing their hands. That's kind of good. <laughs> I, was in the, um, I was in the office of a notable a pastor of a large church having a meeting. And um, it, at the end of our meeting, I asked him where the restroom was and he directed me to his private restroom in his office. And, oh, I was like, we have a restroom in your office. Oh, how nice. <laughs> Maybe that's what I'll hit someday. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> bathroom in my office. So I go in there, use the bathroom. And then I go to the sink and um, no soap. And I look around and no hand towel, paper towels. Nothing. And then I looked at the sink, crusty and dry as can be. And then I regretted shaking that man's hand. <laughs> I'm not saying we should be disgusting or irresponsible, okay? I am saying that is not, you cannot protect your life that much. You can't. I know people who have done everything, masks and sanitizer and, and quarantine and restricted travel and work from home, and they still get sick. This is the world we live in, and another one is gonna come. And the question is, will you let someone exploit and manipulate you into being a part of that which is ruining the lives of everyone else? What about, what about the people who in their hopelessness took their own lives over the past nine months? What about those people? What about those deaths? What about the spousal abuse and addictive behavior and alcoholism and drug abuse that's happened because of the duress people are under? What about the people who can't handle getting a check for $2,000 showing up in their mailbox and they go buy crack? What about those people? This is not the world we're meant to live in. And if you've bought the lie, you're setting yourself up for a great shake and a great fall. And that does not have to be your experience if your hope is in the kingdom of God. And so sin is all around us. Don't be shocked by it. Don't be, don't be shocked when people act crazy. They're striving to have some quality of life and they have no assurance that they will. And they're striving and grappling to hold on to that which is precious and they have no confidence that they'll experience it. And so when they're nasty, that's why. But we're the church of Jesus. We're supposed to be unshakable, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Do you know that? Which means we need to be both sturdy in our faith and our destination and our expectation and also prepared to do the work that only the Christian people can do. The people who are the forgiving people, who are the patient, gentle, kind, uh, ridiculously generous, helping people who cannot help you back at all. That's why I love our kids' volunteers. 
<laughs> it's so much work. It's so hard. And then you go in there and the kids are like, where's my crayons? You know what I mean? None of them ever, they're never like, thank you so much for everything you do to serve us and care for us and teach us about God. No, no. I wanted to sit there. Make him move. That's how they act in there, right? Who, who, who wants to hang out with people like that? Nobody does. No, nobody does. All you want to do is get them to some level of normalcy and then kick them out of your own house. You know what I mean? That's the motive. And yet, and yet, something happens in the human heart when you begin to place your faith in Jesus and you're part of the kingdom of God. No, no, you see children as the future. You see it's worth every bit of sacrifice, every bit of energy, every bit of patient endurance to shape them into people who are gonna actually make our world a better place to live in, right? It's a total perspective shift. So my question is, where have you placed your hope? Are you experiencing a shaking? And are you ready to place your faith in that which will never fail you? Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Every, I was having a conversation with a brother who loves God, loves the people around him, and was asking me, am I making the right choices helping people, continuing to help in this situation? Am I enabling destructive behavior? And I looked him right in the eye and I said, everything you're doing is making an eternal impact. You can never go wrong showing the kind of love that you're showing to the people around you, ever. You may never see it this side of eternity, ever. It may never come back. It may only look like everything you're doing to help allows people to make terrible choices and end up being destructive. But your labor will never be in vain if it's kingdom labor. And so this is what God's ready to empower. And this is what God wants us to stand firm in. And it begins with us not buying the lie that we can medically keep all this going to imperishable. It's not gonna happen. Put our faith in what the kingdom of heaven gifts us through faith in Jesus and then walk in the strength that he provides.